Um, a very warm welcome to tonight's Honors Colloquium, uh, where Robert, Roberta Friedman will be speaking. We had a wonderful class with her. The students had a wonderful class with her, and I know you're going to enjoy uh, the talk tonight. Um, we're required to announce, again, where the exits are. There were three in the back of the auditorium, and two on the side, and then two on the side here in the front. Um, there's restrooms that on, on your right downstairs. is a uh, female restroom and a male on the, the um, your left side, and then there's some unisex uh, restrooms also out um, in the main lobby. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce Allison Tovar, who's from the Department of Nutrition and Food Sciences, and she'll be introducing Roberta Friedman. Um, actually, can I, I forgot to mention next week. Um, next week, we will have Jonathan Gruber, who's a professor of economics from MIT, and he was instrumental in the formulation of the uh, health care reform in Massachusetts, as well as on the national level with the Affordable Care Act. Um, and he'll be talking about uh, the, the Affordable Care Act. So I think it'll be very interesting and very timely being so close to the election. Uh, here's Allison. Good evening. Um, being a new faculty here and starting my career in uh, obesity prevention, it's really a pleasure for me to introduce Roberta Friedman, who's the Director of Public Policy at the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity at Yale University. She educates federal, state, and local policymakers and advocacy organizations about food policy and obesity research and creates resources to help them write and implement effective obesity prevention policies. Prior to her work at the Rudd Center, Ms. Friedman was a program director at the Massachusetts Public Health Association, where she coordinated efforts to pass legislation to improve school nutrition and worked with several New England and statewide coalitions to develop obesity prevention strategies. She is the member of the New Haven Food Policy Council and a founding member of the New Haven Farms. Ms. Friedman received her a Master's of Science in Health and Social Behavior at the Harvard School of Public Health. It's a pleasure to introduce Ms. Friedman. Well, hello, and uh, thank you very much for having me. I really uh, have been looking forward to being here tonight and sharing some of my ideas with you. Um, and I appreciate the colloquium uh, uh, folks that put this together and for URI for inviting me. Um, I have to say that the bill that uh, Allison was talking about when I was working at the Massachusetts Public Health Association was a bill to get junk food and sodas out of schools. And it took 11 years to pass, but it finally passed last year. And so I got to go up, back up to Massachusetts and help them celebrate. So one of the, one of the uh, lessons there is that we have to be we have to have stick to uh, with policy. So I want to talk tonight about what we are calling optimal defaults to prevent obesity. And um, I'm going to tell you very briefly about the Rudd Center uh, and then talk about the disastrous nutrition defaults that we are living with today and how we might improve them to reduce obesity. I'm going to, I'm going to touch on sugar-sweetened beverages as an issue and uh, marketing of junk food to children and very briefly, if we have time, um, on the industry's role in preventing obesity. So uh, the Rudd Center at Yale, we do strategic science, which basically means that we are doing science to try and fill in the gaps and um, increase the evidence base so that the policies that are, pro are promoted, that we promote, and that legislators promote and institutions promote are as science-based as possible and as strong as possible so we can really start to make a dent in uh, the obesity problem. And you can see this list, I won't read it for you, but you can see this list of things that we're doing research on. And um, uh, I, I'll cover a little bit of it tonight um, and maybe you, have, you might have some questions at the end for me about some of them. So I want to start by just giving you a very brief, uh, setting the context very briefly for overweight and obesity in the United States today. So two out of three adults and one out of three children in the country is either overweight or obese. Um, I found this uh, study recently in a report that was just put out by the Trust for America's Health. Children who are obese are more than twice as likely to die before the age of 55 as children whose BMI, or body mass index, is in the healthy range. It's, it's quite disturbing. Uh, the percentage of severely obese adults has risen from 2,000. You can see it's gone up from 3.9% to 
6.6% uh, 6 .6 in 2010. These are the, this is the long, unfortunately long list of related chronic diseases that are associated with obesity and overweight in the country. And these top five, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, arthritis, and cancer, are the, they are the, the leading uh, diseases in this country. And there are others that I didn't even add to this list. Uh, diabetes is certainly a problem, and with adults, you can see this is a, the graph. The far left shows uh, in 1980, there were about 493,000 new cases of diabetes diagnosed in the country. In 2010, we were up to 1.7 million of newly diagnosed, diagnosed cases, and in 2011, 1.9 million. So we've got an epidemic there going, going there as well. And this is especially disturbing for children, for young people under the age of 20, about 215,000 diagnoses of diabetes in the country and about 2 million diagnoses of prediabetes. And we were talking about this before that adult onset, type 2 diabetes used to be called adult onset diabetes and it's not anymore because children as young as 8 and 10 years old are being diagnosed with diabetes. So it's a real, it's a, certainly a, a, a problem. And the American Heart Association is saying that in 2011, no children met the seven criteria for ideal cardiovascular health. And you can see good diet and uh, BMI and physical activity is on that list. Um, obesity is costing us quite a bit of money. In, in the country, obesity, healthcare related um, obesity-related health care costs are up to somewhere between $147 billion a year up to $210 billion a year. Depends on what study you read. Uh, children, um, obesity-related health care costs are about $14 billion a year. Medicaid and Medicare are paying for about $62 billion a year of those obesity-related health care costs. And absenteeism from work is even costing us about $4.3 billion a year. And I thought I'd pull this out for you. This is from um, the Trust for America's Health puts out a, a, um, a report every year called F as in fat. And their 2012 report was very interesting because what they did this time was talked about what would, they did estimates on what would happen to obesity rates and healthcare costs and things like that if we could reduce obesity by 5% within the next 20 years. And you could see from uh, reading this that the, uh, in Rhode Island, if we reduce the average BMI by 5%, it would be a cost savings of more than 850 million in 10 years and $2 billion in 20 years. So significant. Um, so here's a little bit of, of uh, what the current efforts are. This is what public health has been traditionally doing and what the current efforts are to reduce the trend. So we're starting with the individual. We're taking a look at what can we do to, in, to uh, have an influence on the individual's behavior. And so we're educating them. Um, typical way is myplate.gov, the USDA dietary guidelines. But there are hundreds and hundreds of nutrition programs across the country, all trying to say, all saying to people, eat healthy food, uh, get more exercise, um, reduce your sugar consumption, things like that. We are also uh, medicating and operating on overweight and obese people in an effort to reduce obesity. And uh, another thing that's happening is that we're shaming and blaming overweight and obese people with the idea that we're going to motivate them to lose weight. And I'll, I'll say something, I have a note about that for you um, in a couple of minutes. And all of this is what the current trends are in an effort to reduce obesity, but clearly um, we're not doing it yet. These trends, these, these current efforts are not working because obesity rates are rising across the country. Um, there are uh, pockets where, of demographics where the, the rates are going down, but we are starting from such a high level. Even the, the slimmest state in the country, Colorado, has, has too, way too high of a level of obesity. So what's the problem? Why aren't these working? What are we up against? And this is um, what, at the Rudd Center, we talk a lot about, that we are in the midst of what we call disastrous nutrition defaults. And um, I'll, give you, uh, I'll give you some examples of that in a minute, but I thought it would be interesting just to read 
uh, just to know what the definition of a default is, which is the selection that's usually made automatically or without a, a, out active consideration because of a lack of alternatives. And uh, this is a quote from Bill Dietz, who just retired from the Division of uh, Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity at the CDC. Um, and he said, individuals can't be expected to make healthy choices if there are no healthy choices available. So that's what we are talking about with uh, disastrous nutrition defaults. So here's one of them. Um, over, the past, uh, over the past years from 89 to 2012, the cost of soft drinks has risen about 45%. The cost of sugars and sweets about 80%. But the cost of fruits and vegetables has, has risen about 100%. And um, obviously, that's not good for us. It's not good when we're trying to educate people to eat more fruits and vegetables. And in fact, the, the percentage of adults that are getting the recommended five a day, we flatlined on this. From 1996 to 2009, it hasn't nudged up above uh, 25 to 30%. And the same for high school students as well. Um, they are sometimes, in 2007, it looks like they got close to 40%, but um, there are too, far too few of us who are eating the recommended uh, number of fruits and vegetables a day. Another disastrous nutrition default is that we're living in what we call food deserts. A lot of low-income people are living in food deserts, and the USDA has um, uh, accounted for about 6,500 different census tracts around the country that are called food deserts. And these are basically places where people don't have easy access to affordable, fresh, and healthy foods. And so they end up relying on corner grocery stores, which stock mostly processed foods. Another nutrition default is what is being called now uh, food swamps, which means that in a lot of these low-income neighborhoods, the food that is available comes from McDonald's and Taco Bell and other fast food restaurants. And they're full of fat and salt and sugar. Um, and they're very cheap. And low-income people are feeding their families on them because they can get their bellies full. But uh, they are not, they, we're not helping people with these. It's, it's not a healthy diet to be having. Another nutrition default is a, a disastrous default is portion distortion. And if you take a look, these are um, the pictures on the left side of each example are from about 20 to 25 years ago. Our portion sizes have just grown. And we are so used to the large portion sizes that we don't even recognize that they are way over the top and way more than we need to be eating. Um, here's another example of portion distortion. This is a double gulp. It's a 64-ounce uh, beverage container. Um, if you fill it with a sugar-sweetened beverage, there's about 780 calories. If you fill it with a soda, for instance, you're getting about 780 calories and 54 teaspoons of sugar. And I said, as I said in the class today, this doesn't come with two straws. You know, we're not meant to be sharing this with anybody, and people are drinking this, uh, this amount of liquid, and we don't compensate for that amount of liquid by eating fewer solid calories. And so the sugar-sweetened beverages are really a disastrous nutrition default and the sizes that they are coming in now. And this is a 16-ounce um, soda size, which if you've been keeping up at all with uh, what's going on in New York City, Mayor Bloomberg just put a reasonable limit on the serving size for restaurants that are covered by the Board of Health. They can't serve anything larger than uh, 16 ounces. Um, and we'll see if that actually gets put into place because the beverage industry has sued New York City on this. So we'll, we'll wait and see what happens. Um, 13 teaspoons of sugar in 16 ounces, which is about twice the amount of the recommended daily uh, numbers of teaspoons of sugar that we should be having, that any adult should be having in their diet, um, should be much, much less than that. This, I thought, was very interesting. This came out of our Fast Food Facts uh, Marketing to Kids report. At Burger King, a 42-ounce King drink is now a large. This is about portion distortion. A 32-ounce large is now a medium. A 21-ounce medium is now a small. And a 16-ounce is now a value. And it, it reminds me um, a little bit of uh, what they're doing to women's clothing sizes these days. I don't know what size I am anymore because they keep downsizing to make all of us think that we are getting smaller and smaller when, in fact, we're not. Um, 
Another disastrous default is um, what Michael Pollan uh, talks about in his um, uh, book called Food Rules. And one of the things he says is, don't eat anything your great grandmother wouldn't recognize as food. And here's the ingredients list of uh, one food. This is a chemical soup. There are a lot of different kinds of sugars hidden within this uh, list of ingredients. And um, actually what this is, is a Pop-Tart. It's a chocolate banana split Pop-Tart. And it's got seven vitamins and minerals in it. And what the Kellogg's website said about this is you can feel good about sharing the fun of these toaster pastries with your kids because they added in seven vitamins and minerals. Um, this is what Michael Pollan would call a UFO, an unidentified food object. And we're eating a lot of these things. These processed foods are cheap. Uh, they're tasty. They're full of sugar and fat, which is, you know, we're attracted to. But this is part of the disastrous nutrition default. A um, couple other examples of disastrous nutrition default. Who doesn't recognize this? Anybody never seen the Golden Arches before? Um, marketing to children especially, marketing in general of fast food, of junk food, of cereals, is ubiquitous, it's relentless, we are surrounded by it all the time, and it's having an effect, it has an effect on all of us, but of concern, most concern to us at the Rudd Center is that it's having an effect on, on children as well. Here's another example. This might not be quite as recognizable to everyone, but these are the Coca-Cola polar bears. And they don't he even have to, you, you can barely see the Coke label on that bottle. Most people know these polar bears, and they're very, very recognizable. Um, candy at the cash register is a metaphor for a, a, another uh, disastrous nutrition default. Um, what and how much people buy, who, people eat, are highly influenced by contextual factors that they may not recognize and therefore can't easily resist. So there's very promotional strategies, for instance, that are done in supermarkets on you know, putting um, sugary beverages on end caps or putting, um, you've all seen this on the at the checkout aisle, a uh, whole bunch of um, candy and snacks and things like that. Um, this, this is how marketing, the, these companies rely on these kinds of strategies to promote, um, to promote their products and people just automatically buy these things, often without thinking about it. They might not want to be eating those things. They might be, the person might be on a diet, but there it is and it's, it's on the way out. You're about to buy other things, so you just pop one in your cart and uh, then you've got the extra calories. Um, I wanted to point this out as a disastrous nutrition default. This is a website from the Children's Hospital of uh, Philadelphia, and it's a website made especially for the kids to take a look at before they go into the hospital if they're having some procedure done. And I clicked on the eating uh, button so that I could see what they were talking about, and there are your golden arches again. And um, I consider this a disastrous nutrition default because I don't see a place for fast food in a hospital, and especially in a children's hospital. And last but not least, and this is, you know, I, I could do an entire hour just on disastrous nutrition defaults, but this is a um, very typical school lunch. Um, we're, you know, kids are in school all day long. Many of them are relying on the school lunches. So this is actually a very bad default for uh, children in schools. And there is some good, good news about that that's being done. The, the uh, meals are changing in a lot of schools around the country. Um, I, I had said before when I was talking about what the Rudd Center does and about the shaming and blaming issue as one of the current trends and one of the ways that we try and get people to stop um, uh, eating so much. Um, we've done, we do quite a bit of work on weight bias at the Rudd Center. We are trying to prevent obesity, but we also do not want overweight and obese people to be stigmatized. And the sort of general idea of this is that people think if I um, shame somebody into losing weight, if I blame them for their, you know, it's your fault that you're overweight, that that's going to work and it's going to motivate people to lose weight. And in fact, all of the research that we do and that other people are doing around the country find that exactly the opposite happens. So it off, shaming and blaming often results in higher calorie intake, higher program uh, attrition, less weight loss, avoidance of physical activity, and even elevated blood pressure. So it's something to pay attention to. So here's my alternative approach. 
Um, we want to go for what we call optimal nutrition defaults, and I'll explain what I mean. So what we want to do is create optimal environments where it's easy to make a healthy choice, it's easy to reach for something that's going to be more helpful. Um, we're living in an atmosphere that promotes our health, that works with us instead of against us. And there's a variety of ways that this is being looked at now around the country and a variety of ways that we're considering doing it. Um, a couple are legislation and institutional policies, and I'm going to give you some examples of each of these. Um, economics, we're working on, for instance, sugar sweetened beverage taxes. Systems changes, which is basically linking up sectors which have not traditionally been involved with each other um, to try and improve nutrition in the country. Easiest one to talk about is farm to table, farm to institution. Linking up those, those groups so that we get healthy, fresh, local produce, and I hear that that's happening here in Rhode at, at URI, um, get it to the table much more easily and more quickly, and it also helps the environment as well. Um, regulation is one way to go after optimal defaults and create optimal environments, and the built environment as well. And I, because I deal with food policy and obesity and not so much the physical activity, I'm not going to talk too much about, well, I'm not going to talk at all about the built environment tonight, actually, but it's a piece of um, this pie. And, and so what we're trying to do is create these environments which then have an impact. Rather than focusing right on the individual, these all have an impact on the individual instead of blaming or trying to educate, which is not working. And then we're hoping for less obesity. Um, a lot of these policies have not been put into place yet. We're trying to get them passed. Uh, more people are paying attention to optimal defaults. And so um, we're hoping that we are going to see a reduction in obesity because of them. Um, the idea of optimal defaults is actually, actually an economics term. It came from um, some studies, uh, and this is one in particular. And you can see in the blue bars on the right-hand side of the screen, in European countries where you are automatically enrolled in, in organ donation programs, um, and you, if in order to get out of the program, you have to follow certain steps people are much more likely to stay in the program. And so their participation rate is much higher. You can see it's in, up in the 99%, um, which is pretty astounding. Um, the countries on the left and the gold are the ones where you actually, actually have to uh, opt in and say, OK, yes, I will be an organ donator if I die. Um, then uh, you can see that the participation rate is much lower. A couple of other good examples for public health in terms of optimal defaults, uh, seatbelt seat belt laws and all of the, the initiatives that we've been doing around on smoking, including taxes and um, working to stop people from smoking inside buildings and things like that. These are all behaviors. Uh, these are all creating optimal defaults and good environments to make uh, practicing healthful behavior much more easy. So um, I want to give you some examples of the optimal nutrition defaults and the way that public health is working on this right now. So in terms of legislation and economics, and a lot of them overlap with each other, there isn't just a policy that's on systems and one that's just on legislation. Um, they often overlap quite a bit with each other. Uh, the Farm Bill is, uh, was supposed to be reauthorized this year, but it's, it's on hold for now and will probably be taken up again in Congress next year. But what we would like to see and what public health folks across the country would like to see is a shift away from subsidizing the major products like corn, soy, wheat, but especially corn because it makes for um, uh, cheap corn, high fructose corn syrup, which goes into all of these processed foods that we eat. And to have some of those subsidies be shifted over to fruits and vegetables to make them cheaper so that they are more available and more affordable for uh, low-income people especially. Instead of these food deserts that we're um, uh, experiencing all across the country, uh, we're looking for uh, what's a wonderful initiative that's happened in, in Pennsylvania already called the Fresh Food Financing Initiative, a little bit of a tongue twister. Um, and this uh, resulted, this was a bill that was passed many years ago and resulted in the building of about 18 brand new grocery stores in uh, food deserts around the Philadelphia area. And there have been several Congress people who have um, 
uh, proposed fresh food financing initiatives in Congress. Nothing has passed yet. But um, here, this would be one of the ways that we, we could create optimal defaults. Um, there's a lot of very interesting work done, being done on institutional policies, especially in the healthcare arena, um, making sure that the food that's served in hospitals, not only to the staff and to the visitors, but to the patients, which makes a whole lot of sense. If you're in the hospital and, and ill, you should be eating the most healthful foods. Um, so there's wonderful uh, things going on all across the country to try and change the systems, the food systems in healthcare. And there's some great stuff going on here in Rhode Island. I was participate. I participated in a conference um, uh, earlier this year on hospitals for a healthy environment in Rhode Island, and they're looking at sustainability in all different kinds of ways, but including nutrition. And there are a lot of uh, healthcare. Uh, hospitals and healthcare institutions that are saying no to sugar sweetened beverages. And there's an organization called Healthcare Without Harm, which is uh, uh, has a wonderful initiative going on healthier beverages in hospitals. So, in terms of systems, I'm not going to stay on this slide for too long, but because I already said about systems is uh, linking up sectors that have not normally been linked up with each other to deal with food and nutrition. But for instance, um, zoning and planning. If we can get more localities to zone for mixed use and so we can get uh, businesses into traditionally, uh, into neighborhoods that are traditionally only zoned for housing, we can get some, uh, some markets in there, some, some grocery stores in there. Um, transportation, making sure that there's transportation from low-income neighborhoods to the local grocery stores so that people have easier access. So those are the kinds of systems changes that are going on to try and create optimal defaults. And um, Rhode Island just convened a food policy council. Those are wonderful. Food policy councils are great ways to take a look at the entire food system from the production of it to the processing of it, to getting it on people's tables, and then all the way to the composting of it, um, and, and looking at the entire system. And a lot of food policy councils are paying attention to the issue of health and nutrition and obesity when they're dealing with um, the food system. So I'm hoping Rhode Island will do the same as well. In terms of uh, regulation, how regulation can be used to make optimal defaults, um, the USDA is uh, set to write regulations on what's called competitive foods in schools. They've already written a set of regulations for what can, for nutrition standards for the school breakfast and lunch program. But um, competitive foods are those foods that are sold outside the national school breakfast and lunch programs. So it's what's sold in schools in the vending machines, on the a la carte lines, in school stores, for fundraisers. and. Uh, for me, the, and I know a lot of my colleagues at Rudd, the optimal default here would be to get rid of competitive foods altogether. In the states that have um, stronger competitive food regulations, um, more, there's more participation in the national school lunch program, um, and uh, there seems to be some correlation with, with less weight gain. And so regulation is a good chance to um, have an effect on this. And I want to say that the, the USDA is going to come out with their proposed regulations, and this is a great place for the students to get involved. It will, they will be open for public comment. Anybody in the United States can write in, maybe from Europe too, I don't know, but they'll pay attention to uh, those of us from the United States. And students, anyone, can write to the USDA and put in their two cents about uh, the food regs that they write on competitive food. So keep an eye on that. Call me if you don't know when they're coming up. I'll let you know when the, when the discussion, when the public comment period is open. Um, I talked about the, the supersizing of sugar-sweetened beverages, and Mayor Bloomberg, as I, I think I mentioned, uh, has put a reasonable limit on serving sizes of sugar-sweetened beverages. And we are really hoping that this begins to have a dent, make a, make a change in the whole portion distortion issue, and um, be part of optimal nutrition defaults. And in terms of grocery stores, rather than the corner store selling as much processed food as they do, um, w there's a whole institute across the country dealing with healthy corner stores. It's a whole network. 
And what they're doing is helping out with the infrastructure, um, giving grants to small corner stores to have refrigeration, to get access to fruits and vegetables so that the, you know, so that people can go in and get some of this fresh produce from their local store if they don't have immediate access to a grocery store. Um, and here's what University of Vermont has done. They have uh, banned uh, bottled water on the campus and they've put in these filling, what are called filling stations. And um, they also have mandated that at least a third of their beverage vending machines have to be stocked with healthy beverages. And so um, I took a look on the website. I found out that uh, women's soccer here, you beat, Rhode you beat uh, Vermont recently in, um, in soccer. And so I want to say, keep going on that. And the UVM thing was student driven. And so um, see if you can get the university to get rid of sugar sweetened beverages on the campus. You might not like the idea, but it might be helpful. Um, so I'm gonna, I want to cover just briefly, I'm doing okay for time? Good. Yeah, good, okay. Um, I want to bring up two of the issues that we've been working on quite a bit at the Rudd Center on uh, to create optimal defaults, and the first is on sugar-sweetened beverages, and give you a little bit of background on it and what we're trying to do to change the default. So when we're talking about sugar-sweetened beverages, um, traditionally people just think soda, but we're talking about a very wide array of products that are out there now, including sweetened teas, sports drinks, energy drinks, vitamin waters. That blue bottle up in the right-hand corner is, is what's called a fruit drink. Uh, it's mostly high fructose corn syrup with blue coloring in it, and it's actually blue raspberry, which I don't know what that means. Um, but uh, there's a, there are quite a number of initiatives across the country in public health departments to get people, to educate people about reducing their sugar-sweetened beverages, and um, ultimately a lot of them are aiming for taxes. Um, the reason that we're going after sugar-sweetened beverages are, there are many reasons, and one of them is that, uh, this graph shows you, it's a little complicated to look at, but the right-hand side uh, from sodas all the way down to alcohol beverages is the amount of, um, that is being contributed to added sugar in our diets on a daily basis from beverages. And you can see sodas are the single largest contributor of added sugars in our diets. And they're junk calories, they're empty calories, there's no nutrition in them, and they're contributing to weight gain um, and to a variety of other diseases. Adults are drinking about 82, 85 two-liter bottles a year. That's 46 gallons a year of sugar-sweetened beverages. Somebody's drinking mine because I'm, I don't drink them, but um, you know, this is on average what Americans are consuming. Um, I don't have the same kind of statistics, but I thought this was a very compelling uh, advertisement that was done by a public health department out in California basically saying our kids are drowning in sugar and this was part of their sugar sweetened beverage um, education campaign. Uh, another reason that we are targeting sugar sweetened beverages is that the, sol the science is solid on it. There, there is a solid association between the consumption of sugar sweetened beverages and obesity and weight gain, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, dental caries, uh, gout, uh, hypertension, stroke, and the studies keep coming. I just um, revised and updated our sugar sweetened beverage tax policy brief, and the number of studies that have been done over just in the past two or three years is really astounding, and most of them are saying, are showing that there is an association. Traditionally, if you find a study that um, finds no association between the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages and any of these diseases. It's usually, it has traditionally been funded by the beverage industry, which is not surprising. So what we are proposing is a penny per ounce tax on sugar-sweetened beverages, an excise tax, not a sales tax, so that the beverage um, is more expensive, shows up as a more expensive beverage on the shelf so that when rather than seeing um, a tax at the, after you get through the, the uh, register, cash register line and you've paid for it, you have to look at your receipt. That would be the sales tax to see that you've paid extra. An excise tax would be levied on the manufacturer or, or, or the bottler, and 
the assumption, our assumption is that they would pass the tax on to consumers. Uh, um, our um, economic analysis of this uh, showed that, a ten that in fact, sugar sweetened beverages are what's called price elastic. So a 10% increase in the price would result in a 10 to 12% decrease in consumption. And a penny per ounce tax is about a 20% increase. And a crucial piece of this, and this was part of the legislation here in Rhode Island, um, the, the sugar sweetened beverage tax uh, bills that have been filed for the past three and maybe four years, that the money that's raised is earmarked for obesity prevention, not just going into the general fund, but going for obesity prevention or for some other um, uh, nutrition program that helps low-income people, that helps uh, people uh, get easier access to fresher, more healthful produce. Um, there have been a, several studies that have been done, and basically, you know, we can't, because no, no tax has been passed yet, a penny per ounce tax has been passed yet, we don't actually know if this is going to work, but all of the economic modeling has said that, in fact, it will. And this is a study from uh, Claire Wang and her colleagues. Uh, she's at Columbia, and she did determine that uh, sugar, a penny per ounce tax would cut health care costs, would cut the burden of diabetes. And um, they did a similar study uh, in, out of uh, University of Chicago in Illinois to show the impacts of, impact of a penny per ounce tax. And it would reduce uh, the number of obese youth by 9.3%, which is significant. Adults by 5.2%. Diabetes incidence would go down. Obesity-related health care costs would go down. And um, so we are assuming that this tax would work in that way, and we're very hopeful that one, a state or a city will pass a tax fairly soon. Um, right now, the ones that are about to be voted on, there are two small cities in California, Richmond and El Monte, which have ballot initiatives to try and get a business license fee, which would be the equivalent of a penny per ounce tax on sugar-sweetened beverages. The beverage industry is fighting it tooth and nail. They're pouring loads of money into fighting it, and um, we'll see what happens. But I think that in this new legislative session in states that's going to begin in 2013, that uh, we'll see more of the, the uh, beverage taxes filed. This is the, the policy brief that I mentioned. It's on our website if you're interested in taking a look at an um, updated version, and, and uh, it, we list a lot of the, the um, major studies that have been done in the past several years on it. So I want to switch gears for a minute, excuse me, to um, the issue of marketing of junk food to kids. We're doing quite a bit of research on this, um, and have put out several large reports on it, which I'll, I'll give you some statistics on it. Um, but this is, is, we think, the one of the newest and best ways that we can begin to change the disastrous nutrition defaults and go for optimal defaults. And why are we targeting it? Um, the Institute of Medicine put out a book-length report in 2005 on the marketing of junk foods and beverages to kids. And the opening line in the report is, marketing works. We're doing this because uh, the industry spends quite a bit of money, $2 billion a year, spent on targeting just children and adolescents. And um, they know that it works, and they are in there, and the marketing is relentless, and it's everywhere, and it's unfortunately having quite an impact on children. It's promoting, they promote unhealthy products, and they're reinforcing unhealthy behaviors. So I'll give you some, uh, some of the interesting data that came out of uh, the three different reports that we've done over the past three years. So this past year, we put out a report on sugary drinks and marketing to children and found that um, the marketers, the sugary drink manufacturers are targeting children, teens, and black and Hispanic youth in particular. Um, our, we did, our first study was on cereal facts, and uh, what we found was that, in fact, the least nutritious cereals are the ones that are most heavily marketed and advertised to children. And we did a follow-up just this year to see if things had improved anymore, and in fact found that um, they are still marketing the worst cereals to children. Those are the ones that the, the kids see most in uh, the different marketing venues. We also did a fast food facts uh, report on marketing of fast food, 
And this is an interesting one in terms of defaults. Most fast food restaurants have at least one healthy side dish and beverage option if you order a kid's meal, uh, but they are rarely offered as the default. So instead of, you know, if you go up with your child and you order a kid's meal, instead of getting the burger and, or the McNuggets and um, uh, apples and water or low or non-fat milk, by default, you're instead getting the fries and um, the Coke or, or a, a sugar-sweetened beverage. And, you know, we're not seeing a big enough change. McDonald's did do something with this. They are now, part, the, the default meal for kids is a smaller portion of fries and a smaller portion of apples, um, which is a step in the right direction. Um, also in terms of of marketing to kids. You know, we traditionally think that uh, where kids are seeing these ads are, are uh, t on TV. But there's this whole industry growing up which we're calling advertainment, and I'll give you some examples of it. And this is what kids are seeing constantly. So product placement is one of the things. This is, a, a, if you follow American Idol at all, this is an older set of judges. Uh, most of them, I think, are gone by now. Um, but if you watch American Idol, they always have a glass of Coke in front of them. Um, Coke heavily markets and heavily underwrites American Idol. And um, this is about product placement. So products like this are getting put into movies and TV shows, and um, they're all over the place. And American Idol, the, actually the demographics for this, a lot of very, very young children are watching American Idol. So they are being marketed to uh, by Coca-Cola. Um, something called viral marketing. A lot of the social media stuff is taking over in terms of, and, and there's still quite a bit of TV ads, but um, viral marketing, if you go on, for instance, on the Reese's Puffs website, it's a serial website, um, they will try and get you to sign up, uh, and this is for children, get you to sign up and send your email, but also get you to put in your uh, friend's name and email so that they can send a link to the friend as well. And um, this is actually being investigated as a violation of the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. And so we're hoping to see some of this stop pretty soon because um, uh, you can't market to kids that way and, and, and use them to uh, do your marketing for you. Um, another way that kids are seeing ads is what's called mobile apps, and these are on smartphones, on tablets, on iPod touches, things like that. And this is an example from uh, Coke. Um, it's a little difficult to read this, but they, you know, basically they'll say they can answer any question for you um, about anything that comes up, and, and uh, kids are going to these websites quite a bit. And this is just purely advertising. They're even going to younger kids. This is for Applejack cereal. And kids can go in and play a race to the bowl game. Um, and again, it's, it's pure advertainment. It's advertising that's being marketed to kids, that's being aimed at kids. Facebook is in the mix, too. This is a new cereal. I don't know if you've seen this. It's called Crave. Um, talk about food and addiction. Uh, this is chocolate for breakfast. And um, so they are asking people to go on this website. They're connecting it to uh, text messages. And also on the bottom, you can see that they've got a Facebook page. So this is one of the other ways with social, new social media that they are marketing to kids. In addition to all these other sort of not Twitter is not traditional, but more traditional uh, ways of advertising to kids. So they are seeing these ads all over the place all the time. Um, quite a bit of it. And this is a place where we see parents as the change agents for this. Um, I don't know if, you have, if you've read about Pink Slime, if you heard about it. This was earlier in the year. It's, Pink Slime is a, uh, is a perfect term for this. The parents, um, found, parents found out about it and found out that, the, uh, that there's a processing that they do with beef uh, where it's ammoniated to get, uh, you know, bacteria and different things out of it, and it ends up looking like pink and looking slimy, and um, it ends up in many school lunches. And a parent, I don't remember where she's from, but a parent found out about this and, and labeled it pink slime, got outraged about it, and sent out emails all, the, all over the place. And this is a different kind of uh, viral marketing, but for, the, for a good cause. And um, basically, put a, 
I don't know if they put a, a complete stop on it, but the USDA pulled back and stopped sending as much anyway of, the, of this product to schools. And so we're hoping that parents will be the change agent for the marketing issue um, because marketing in schools is ubiquitous and it's in all these different places that you wouldn't think of. Um, for instance, on, in textbooks, I put textbooks there second. Um, often a lot of uh, the, the uh, lessons are using branded products to teach kids how to do math. Um, you know, it can be about business, it can be about economics, things like that. But there are a lot of ways, besides just the basic things of having vending machines in schools that have big logos on the vending machines or, um, you know, sponsorships from, from soda companies so that the, the scoreboard is branded with the soda company and things like that. And we are really hoping that parents are uh, going to get riled up about this and learn more about it and become active in their school systems to try and get the marketing out of the schools. And we've just hired a director of advocacy resources on marketing to uh, try and reach out to parent groups across the country to see if we can get them interested. It's, it's, a, it's a harder sell. It's a, it's not, it doesn't seem as obvious that people would um, think that marketing has that much of an effect on kids, but we're trying to teach them about the impact it actually does have and see if we can <clears throat> get something going. Excuse me. So I want to end with um, just a little bit about optimal defaults and the food and beverage industry and whether they are helping or hindering uh, public health efforts on this. And, you know, I, I think you can answer on both sides. Um, I'd be happy to discuss this more with anybody that's interested. But I want to show you some examples of some things that are going that seem to be a step in the right direction. So Coca-Cola a while ago uh, said that they would put the calorie counts on their um, cans, and they've done that. And just recently, uh, San Antonio, Texas, and Chicago, the mayors in those two cities came to an agreement with uh, the beverage industry that the vending machines that were um, uh, government-owned, they would uh, put the calorie counts on the beverage machines and also encourage people to buy the lower-calorie beverages as well. Um, it's a good thing. It's a step in the right direction. Um, unfortunately, for, from our vantage point, what it probably means is that there, we, we will not be able to pass a tax in either of these cities because um, the city will say that we're doing this and this is enough. And, and it's not, a tax would be much farther reaching. Uh, it would have a greater impact on the entire population whereas I'm not sure how many people go to these vending machines. Um, and, but, you know, you could see this as a good thing. Um, one of the things that we see as the beverage industry getting the, in the way of optimal defaults and hindering is that they, when they uh, see a tax happening in a state or know that it's coming, they throw money at it. This was, uh, you can see this is a chart from 2006 up to 2011. And in 2009, uh, the Health Care Act was being negotiated. And um, as I said in the class today, for about five minutes, uh, they considered a penny per ounce tax on sugar-sweetened beverages to help fund the Health Care Act. And you can see how you know, the beverage industry poured millions of dollars into lobbying. It's gone down somewhat, but they are focusing a lot on, um, it, it, they are pouring their money into fighting on more local level. This was for Congress. Uh, one of the things that they do is create these front groups. Uh, this is a national one called Americans Against Food Taxes. Uh, if you go on the website, it says it's a consumer uh, coalition. But in fact, if you look at the membership of the Americans Against Food Taxes, every major food company and beverage company is on there and part of it. And um, they are even going to towns like Richmond, California, which I just mentioned is, has a, a tax initiative on its ballot for November. And they've got the Richmond version of Americans Against Food Taxes. And they pour money into fighting what is meaningful change. Um, and so we're not sure that they are, whether they are helping or hindering uh, the, optimal, the fight for optimal defaults. 
And a couple of other examples of this, one of the ways that the industry is fighting us is that that's a slice of pizza on the top. And um, the USDA just recently wrote new regulations for food standards for what can be served to kids in schools in the National School Lunch Program. And one of the things that they originally wanted to do was not allow the tomato paste that goes on pizza to be counted as a vegetable. They were lobbied very hard by the, beverage, by the food industry on this, and um, this is how pizza became a vegetable. Um, and so we lost on that, and pizza is still part, it's, it's considered part of a balanced meal. And uh, I wanted to mention the interagency working group on food marketed to children. This was um, the interagencies, the agencies that we're talking about are the USDA, the FDA, the FTC, and the CDC came together, people from those agencies came together and wrote a set of really good nutrition standards for what could be marketed to, for foods and beverages that could be marketed to children. And these were meant to be voluntary standards. Nobody was twisting the industry's arm to say you have to follow this. It was just a set of voluntary uh, guidelines and the industry came out in full force against it, and Congress uh, put it on hold. So the, basically, the nutrition standards are um, on hold now, and we don't know if they'll be revived or not. And I just wanted to point out my, uh, the executive director of the Rudd Center, Kelly Brownell, who's my boss, uh, just wrote a perspective piece in PLOS Medicine on uh, thinking, he calls it thinking forward, the quicksand of appeasing the food industry. And it's an interesting uh, way to take a look at it if you're interested in this whole issue of whether um, the food and beverage industry can be part of the solution or are they just part of the problem. Uh, he's pointing out some of the, those issues as well. So I'm going to end there. and I'm, I think I'm in pretty good time. And um, I t please take a look at our website. We've got all kinds of information on it. We, we put up all of our publications. We've got a revenue tax calculator on it, so if you were interested to see how much um, could be raised by a penny per ounce tax on sugar sweetened beverages here in Rhode Island, and it's about $45 million a year uh, could be raised with a penny per ounce, or you can see what could be raised nationally or in any other state that you might be interested in. Uh, and we've got all kinds of resources on sugar sweetened beverages, on uh, preschool and school nutrition, on weight bias as well, on all of the different issues that we are doing research on. So I hope that you will take a look at that um, and uh, uh, give, us, give me a call, give anybody in the center a call if you have more questions. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Lots of questions. I don't see that here. My, should I just? Uh, yeah, it's up there. So if government subsidies were shifted to vegetables, do you think there's a risk that those veggies could be engineered into something less like a food and more like an industrial commodity, read pink slime, in the same way that corn has become high fructose corn syrup? Uh, short answer is sure. <laughs> I mean, it's certainly possible. Uh, we would hope not. I mean, the, the, you know, the food industry, there are about 85,000 different processed food products in the country today that we buy. Um, and so it's certainly possible, but we are hoping that if government subsidies, if this ever happened, I, I don't know that it's going to happen in this, this next go-round, although there are a lot of public health people and environmental people working on the government subsidies. Um, but we would hope that it would shift to the vegetables and fruit and make them cheaper so that they can get in, in their uh, original states, whole fruit, whole vegetables, real food, uh, get into the markets and make them cheaper. Next question. College students can be positive role models for younger children by eating healthy foods, exercising regularly, adding educators to nutrition classes, and helping with sustainable farming initiatives. Do you have suggestions or examples of other ways college students can help combat childhood obesity? Uh, yeah, <laughs> lots of ways. Um, keep involved, keep reading about the issues because they're evolving all the time. Uh, when you see a bill coming up here in Rhode Island or a bill in your home state if you're not from Rhode Island, um, call your legislator and say that you uh, like the idea of the bill, encourage him or her to vote for it. Um, I'm not supposed to be saying that because that's lobbying, but it's one of the things you can educate your legislator about. 
Um, get involved in local sustainable food programs. Go to your, if there, is a, a, if there are local food policy councils, get involved with them or get involved with the Rhode Island State Food Policy Council and find out about the whole system. Um, there's a wonderful organization called Food Corps, which was started by Kurt Ellis, who uh, produced the movie called King Corn, which I really um, recommend you seeing. And what they do is train uh, college students to go out all across the country and work in school systems on gardens and uh, healthy food initiatives in schools. So you can get involved on that kind of level. Um, pay attention to policy and um, you know, uh, go to public health school and work on nutrition issues. Uh, become a lawyer and work on public health and nutrition issues. A uh, whole range of things. But there are so many different opportunities out there. And I'm seeing, especially in terms of food and nutrition, um, a lot of local uh, growing, um, growing of gardens, urban gardening and things like that. There's a man out in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, named um, Will Allen, who is he started something called Growing Power. And he does wonderful things with urban initiatives. And he trains people at Growing Power in Milwaukee. And you could get involved in things like that as well. But get active here and uh, try and make some changes here on the campus. Next question. Are there good models in other countries for regulating what can be marketed to children? Uh, yes. Um, Canada, uh, I believe it's British Columbia. I might be wrong about this. It might be Quebec. Um, has banned marketing to children. And I, uh, I'm not as well versed in global. So I know that there are some other countries in Europe that have banned marketing to children. And um, so they are setting a good standard. Um, and it would be something that we are trying to follow here, but we're, we're uh, a far cry from it at this point. After taxing sugary drinks, what do you see as the next step in changing the economics of food? Um, I'm hoping for, uh, well, I don't know about taxes on other uh, foods. Uh, we are focusing on the sugar-sweetened beverages because we've got this solid science that links the consumption to the chronic diseases. It would be nice to see more of the processed foods become more expensive. Um, so again, the, the farm bill would be a good way to deal with this, uh, with subsidies on uh, corn, for instance, and subsidizing the fruits and vegetables. Um, more Taxes might be the way to go at this point, though. We, and we have a long way to go with it. So I'm, I haven't actually been looking too far beyond that. What is being done in schools to educate children from the earliest age to understand the benefits of eating healthy foods? And what incentives are we offering parents to buy and serve healthy foods? Um, unfortunately, my answer to that is not enough, in my answer to the first question. We need to do more nutrition education. I know in New Haven, for instance, the kids get an hour or so um, you know, per semester or something like that of nutrition education. So it's not being done in schools nearly enough. And um, in, we need to start in preschool. We need to start not only educating the kids, but making preschool environments as healthy as possible. Because even preschool kids are not getting enough fruits and vegetables. They're eating way too much fat and salt. Um, we need to stop serving so much juice. Even if it's 100% juice, we, not, we need to stop serving that much to kids in schools. There are, in preschools, um, I know out in, in a relative of mine is a director on the UC Berkeley campus uh, of their preschool programs, and they don't serve any juice at all to preschool kids. Um, they get plenty of it. It's very caloric. There is some nutrition that comes along with it, but uh, better to serve water. So we need to be doing more of the education. And um, uh, the, in terms of incentives, um, you know, we need to do a lot more of the, the incentivizing in terms of uh, making fruits and vegetables lower priced than the processed foods, getting more access for parents to the good foods. Um, and of course, education, I, you know, I hope I didn't uh, give you the idea that I don't think education is a good thing on this. We do need to be educating parents much more on the issue as well. 
Many healthcare professionals smoke, are obese, and overall are not healthy. <laughs> the audience likes that. What efforts should public health officials make towards healthcare professionals to ensure that they are good examples or role models of healthy lifestyle practices that they uh, preach? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that there should not be anything special necessarily done. We need to get these messages out to everybody. I mean, two-thirds of adults in this country are overweight or obese, so it's going to be people in the healthcare industry and in every other industry as well. And we just need to keep on pushing for changing the environment and changing the optimal default so that we can get everybody back to a, a healthy weight. It is health, politics, and money, so we get to ask, how would you respond to the argument that taxes as a form of portion control is akin to rationing? Well, um, I haven't thought about this issue. I, uh, it's not quite, I wouldn't call taxes portion control exactly. The, thi the, the uh, claim that's been aimed at, at us in terms of taxes is, is that they are regressive, um, that they have a, a that they will impact, have an impact on lower income people uh, because lower income people have to spend a larger percentage of their budget on food, that the taxes would be disproportionately affecting them. The way that we think about that is that um, uh, diabetes and obesity um, are impact, having an impact on lower income. They are regressive diseases. They're having an impact on lower income people to a greater degree. And so it's, you know, ultimately not useful, I think, to talk about it as regressive. I, I don't quite see it as rationing. Um, you know, we are not saying to anyone that you can't buy a sugar-sweetened beverage. We're just charging a little bit more. We're just saying charge a little bit more for it. Um, but we're really hoping that it's the kind of incentive that pushes people to go toward, you know, going home and drinking their tap water instead. Um, on the potential impact of taxes, why is more blame being directed at the marketing and not at the parents who purchase the product? Um, well, for all of the reasons that I talked about in terms of the marketing in the first place, that marketing works and the industries know that the marketing works, they're pouring money into it. And um, we are actually, we're trying to regulate the marketing to kids under the age of 12. You know, we're not talking about uh, marketing to adults, but really to try and take it away, take it away from the atmosphere, from the environments where children um, are working, learning, playing, um, because it's it, kids under the age of 12 have a difficult time distinguishing between what's an ad and what's the truth, and so we're working on that. Um, and you know, because we live in what's been called an obese, obesogenic environment. Um, it doesn't help to blame the parents for this. Uh, you know, we are all living in this environment that pushes the junk food at us, that markets the junk food, that makes it cheaper. So it's very, very difficult, as I explained in the whole um, pattern, in the whole cycle with optimal defaults, it's very difficult to, um, you know, for a parent who means to do the right thing to maybe have access to the healthier foods, to teach their children how to resist the healthier food, resist the, the junk foods. So it's, it's more about changing the defaults. Um, what do you think of food day tomorrow, <laughs> October, is that tomorrow? Uh, it's, October yeah, 24th, it's tomorrow. are you celebrating? Yes, <laughs> I'm celebrating. By eating. Um, I, I think Food Day is a great thing. It's, it's, uh, it was something started by Mike Jacobson at the Center for Science and the Public Interest. And it's, you know, it's not going to change the world, but it's, it's going to bring awareness to the issue uh, more and more. This is the second year of Food Day. Um, in, at Yale and in New Haven, we are going to have a celebration at um, the Peabody Museum, which is a, a, a museum of natural history on the campus. And We've got what's called the Big Food Exhibit, um, which we helped curate with a, um, another uh, organization on the campus. And uh, so we're going to be celebrating. And it's just another way to bring up the issue and to focus on the problems with what's going on in our food systems in the country. And sure, I think it's a good thing.
The next question, you were a founding member of New Haven Farms, an urban gardening and nutrition education initiative. What's the most challenging aspect about administering this program? I can answer that in one question. It's money. Um, New Haven Farms is uh, now two years old, a little over two years old, and basically what we're doing is putting large gardens into low-income neighborhoods. Uh, we've connected up with a local uh, community clinic and their diabetes prevention program, and so the patients in the diabetes prevention program are basically given a prescription to come work in the gardens if they are physically able to and to take home fresh produce every week and they get uh, education we, all through the summer. We've had uh, cooking classes for them so that if they've never um, cooked kale before, they now know what to do, what they can do with it. And, um, you know, it's a great idea and it's happening all over the country. There are more and more initiatives like this and it's very important. And they're not being very, you know, we don't have money. Uh, we're, we're searching hard for the money to keep going on it. And I think that's unfortunately the problem with a lot of these kinds of organizations across the country. Do you think such issues as overpopulation and globalization will negatively affect our food sources? I don't know that I can answer that. I, uh, hmm. The globalization, um, I think that because, as, as you know, if you go to Europe now, you see a lot of McDonald's there. You see a lot of American uh, brands there. And I think that's one of the downsides of the globalization in that way because um, we're spreading an unhealthy message to other countries as well. Um, I think I'm going to leave my answer there because I, I don't have a lot to say about overpopulation. Uh, again, on the potential impact of taxes, is the expected decrease in the incidence of poor food consumption and the subsequent saving and health care factored in with the yearly rate of increase in health-related problems. i got to read this a little more carefully. Let's see. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure I know how to answer this question either. It's very complicated. Um, so decrease in the incidence of poor food consumption. Um, so we are certainly, and again, this is, we're talking about sugar sweetened beverage taxes, so we are hoping for, we're expecting a decrease if a tax passes. Um, and, you know, the, the health care savings that we're trying to, there's a, actually a group at Harvard that's trying to see what the impact would be on health care costs with a penny per ounce tax. Their, their work is not finalized yet, and so there's no published studies on that. But we're, yes, we're hoping that, uh, a, a tax will have enough of an impact on overweight and obesity that it will then have an impact on health care costs. What is the most or one of the most important actions that we as citizens can implement into our daily lives to prevent obesity? Um, if you are able to, eat whole foods. Eat fresh fruits and vegetables, eat whole grains, uh, stay away from added sugar. Um, I'm not a dietitian, and I and we don't talk about diets at the Rudd Center. But um, you know, if you are able to uh, do that as much as possible and get plenty of physical activity, um, it's certainly a part of the a, a, a good part of the equation. And you know, again, we are the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity, so I haven't focused so much on physical activity. But I also would encourage you, as I did before, to really pay attention to the politics of all this and what's going on around the country, what's happening in your town, in your city, in your state, in terms of um, food policy and obesity, and um, you know, become political about it and, and do some, go out and, and have some action on this. Another interesting question. Does Whole Foods deliver value in food and nutrition? You mean Whole, I'm assuming this means Whole Foods, the supermarket? Whole Foods, Whole Inc. Foods. Whole Foods, Inc. Uh, I, don't, I can't answer that. I don't know about Whole Foods. Um, I mean, we have Whole Foods in Connecticut, and I know they're, they, uh, they're in a lot of states across the country, but I, I, I don't have the answer for it. What can businesses do to encourage healthy behaviors? What incentives work for them? Um, 
businesses, all different kinds of businesses, can institute good nutrition policies. And we're seeing this happen all across the country more and more, in the same way as when I was talking about the healthcare institutions that are putting policies in place that uh, set nutrition standards for what can be uh, served in the hospitals. We're seeing a lot of different organizations that are beginning to pay attention to this. And it doesn't matter the size of the organization. Write a policy that says that in our meetings and events, we will serve only healthy beverages, only healthful foods, um, and put limits on, on uh, calories and on percentage of fat and sat fat and sugar in the snacks that are served and things like that. So small organizations, any kinds of businesses can do that, can institute that kind of policy. And it's great to have it written so that it's more likely to be followed. Um, and, you know, we're also working with supermarkets. Uh, there, I say we broadly. The, uh, there's a group of people around the country that are beginning to work with supermarkets to see if we can get them to change some of their marketing practices and the cooperative marketing agreements that they do with the beverage companies, for instance, so that there are, um, so that there are the healthier options are more prominently placed on the end caps of supermarket aisles, um, in the, the coolers that are right at the checkout lines, things like that. Um, if, if the industries, if those kinds of businesses want to be part of the solution, there are those kinds of things that they can do to reduce the marketing and to really push healthier products. And we'll go last question. Do you think there's a danger in restricting personal freedom if you eradicate sugar sweetened beverages and other unhealthful, unhealthy substances in schools and institutions that freely offer healthy alternatives? This is a question that comes up a lot and you know people talk about especially kids in high school need to have choice. Um, I, I personally don't believe that uh, institutions like that, that schools are a place to be selling something that is harming people's health and we've got the science to say that it's harming people's health. And um, we first, we're not saying eradicate sugar sweetened beverages from the planet. Some people might say that, but um, what we're the other thing to keep in mind is that as soon as a child steps outside the school, uh, they've got plenty of choices, and probably right at the corner grocery store. So um, there's plenty of opportunity and plenty of choice outside of the school system. It doesn't have to be inside the school. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Friedman. Um, I think we all realize what, what, a, uh, what a growing problem obesity is in the United States, but I think hearing a talk like this it really gives us a, a much clearer picture of how complex the, the, the issue is and how many different factors. Um, I hope we're all inspired um, to, to get involved, to be aware of what's happening um, in our towns and cities, and to be, to be part of the solution. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.